Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Comic-Con Metapod. I'm Hector Navarro. On today's show, we've got John Piricello, writer, producer, cartoon YouTuber, and Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra expert is going to help me break down all the up-to-date news about the Avatar-verse. Then, John and I are talking to the hosts of Avatar Braving the Elements, the Avatar The Last Airbender podcast, Janet Varney, a.k.a. Korra, and Dante Bosco, a.k.a. Zuko. We're going to try not to geek out too hard, but no promises. We've got Jeremy Zuckerman, one half of the track team and composer for Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, who's going to talk to us about the most epic music ever. And finally, this is huge, we've got Brian Konitzko and Michael DiMartino, the creators and executive producers of Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, and the chief creative officers of Avatar Studios. Holy crap, what a show. But first, let's get into it, starting with the brilliant John Piricello. John, how are you, my friend? Brilliant. I'm doing well. (laughs) <laughs> How are you, Hector? How have you been? I am great, man. Thank you so much for being on the show today. So excited that, that that I could recruit you to geek out about some Avatar stuff. But I got some questions for you before we get started. John, what made you want to start a YouTube channel exclusively talking about cartoons? Honestly, it started as a hobby because I I love cartoons so much and I, I kind of want to write them. I would like that's That's still a goal of mine is to write for script driven cartoons uh, and I kind of just started as a hobby to showcase that I understand character I understand story structure and I have a passion for the medium and for the stories being told in that medium uh, and then it just kind of ended up taking a, a life of its own on after that but wow. that was what started it yeah well you're absolutely right you, t- you have such great breakdowns of the stories and the characters of so many different cartoon shows, stuff that's for like younger audiences, but also stuff that's for like, I guess would be considered the prime time sort of cartoon sitcoms, you know, things like King of the Hill. You're the King of the Hill expert in my (laughs) mind. You've talked about The Simpsons, you've talked about BoJack Horseman, all this great stuff. Also, your channel name on YouTube is Johnny Two Cellos. Now, have have you ever had people earnestly ask you, John Piricello, where you got that name from? (laughs) Uh, they never stop. <laughs> I, I, I get that question more often than anything. People say, oh, so do you play cello? Why it's, what's the name about? Two at once, it's, baby. I play two at yeah, once. Yeah. And there's also a band called Two Cellos, so it gets even more confusing. Cool. Uh, but it's just a play on my name. John Paracello, John Pair of Cellos, Johnny Two Cellos. That's, oh, the, that's how it works. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That was secretly a way for me to ask without looking dumb and now you the answer. <laughs> um, so your YouTube channel, Johnny Two Cellos, it currently has over 200,000 subscribers. Did you ever think that the stuff that you were putting out, just kind of like you mentioned, for yourself as this hobby... Did you ever think that a channel like that could get that popular? I didn't. I didn't know it would. I didn't think it would. It was just kind of like I had all these ideas and things in my brain and I wanted to get them out there somehow. Uh, and my channel's evolved a lot over the years. I've, I've taken down a lot of my early videos that I'm not as proud of, but uh, I've had such a great time evolving with the content and the fact that people care about what I say is it's really rewarding it's yeah. it's really fun i get to have a dialogue with my fans who with fans of the same things as me almost every single day and it's it's a really fun way to make a living yeah that's awesome yeah you really are a true artist you don't like some of your earlier stuff that's a true artiste <laughs> my friend a true artiste which is great what has been your favorite show or movie that you've covered on the podcast that you co-host with Toonrific Tariq, oh. Cartoons That Curse. What has been your favorite thing that you guys have covered on that podcast? Shout out to my co-host, Toonrific Tariq, great guy. Um, we So we do this this podcast, Cartoons That Curse. We mostly cover adult animated shows, kind of mm-hmm. what you mentioned earlier, the sitcom type of mm-hmm. thing. But also like, yeah, like Big Mouth and like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've done home movies, Archer, Futurama, Simpsons, but it takes a while to do those. We do a season every episode. And usually we do like, we even sometimes split those in half. So we'll do mm-hmm. like, we cover two seasons a month basically. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to say what my favorite is. It's either Futurama or The Simpsons, I would say. They're, those are just out. my two favorites. Yeah. And we, yeah. we covered the first four seasons of Futurama and the movies, but we've only done the first season of The Simpsons so far. Mm. But Tariq and I, that is the shortest season of The Simpsons. It's only 13 episodes. Yep. Tariq and I talked for three and a half hours about The Simpsons. <laughs> we could not help ourselves. We just have so much to say when it comes to that show. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that one as my answer. Yeah. Somebody's listening to this right now and they're going, Simpsons season one? 
three and a half hours, sign me up. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I hope and so. That's the kind of person you want to find for your stuff. Uh, no, but I totally agree. There's so much to unpack with shows like that, and especially The Simpsons. That first season, I think people tend to dismiss it too. It's like, oh, it's really rough. But it's like there were so many solid things already established in that first season that they're still basically using to this day, which is wild. 1989, 1990. Wild. Anyway. That season has a very special place in my heart. I used yeah. to feel that way where I'm like, oh, this wasn't quite The Simpsons yet. Yeah. But there's something about that season that is so charming to me. I, I love it a lot. Yeah. Uh, John, what is your favorite cartoon show of all time? Do we have time to unpack uh. this? No. Um, <laughs> that's such a hard question. I mean, Simpsons and Futurama are up there for sure. BoJack yeah. Horseman, is, as far as newer shows, definitely up there. King of the Hill. And then, and, and honestly, Avatar and Korra, those are, yep. those are the two very different genres. Those are like, you know, action adventure shows. So it's hard to characterize them with things like The Simpsons. But those are the ones I probably revisit the most. I, re, I watch through Avatar and Korra at least once a year, each Whoa. show. I just, I can't help myself. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're the perfect person to join me on this podcast. But one last question, because I want to brag about something you and I did together. <laughs> John, we used to work on a show together called Animation Investigation. Do you ever still think about that massive shared Cartoon Universe video that we made where we connected dozens and dozens and dozens of cartoon realities together? I never stop thinking about it, Hector, <laughs> because because at this point there are so many more we could add to the puzzle, That's and I'm like, we need hear. to go That's back and do it hear. again. We had over 200 shows connected in that, and I think we could get up to 400. I really think we could. If we There's have the rights to, we should use the clip from Lost where Jack was saying, <laughs> we have to go back because that's how I feel about that video. And I just want to plug it and now people can go search for it and enjoy it. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, John, thank you for answering some of those questions and joining me for today's episode, the Avatar expert that you are. Are you ready to talk about some newsstand items? I'm always ready to talk about All the right. news. So. Hit, us with, hit us with that first newsstand item, my friend. So, big deal. Avatar Studios announced they're working on three Avatar World movies. And the first is going to be directed by Lauren Montgomery. Fans may know a supervising producer on Legend of Korra, as well as uh, another, just a ridiculously huge list of other animation credits. We've also been hearing rumors that the first film will be about Avatar Kyoshi, a prequel. Uh, the second would be about Zuko. And the third would be about Korra, set after The Legend of Korra. Oh. Hector, how do these ideas sound to you? How stoked are you about this idea? I am beyond stoked. And hearing those three potential pitches, right, because it hasn't been quite confirmed yet that that's what the subject matter is going to be, it feels like it's all no-brainer stuff. But mm -hmm. it's also, like, so exciting to know that the first one out of the gate is Kiyoshi. Because that's kind of a risk. It's kind of, I mean, I know you're a massive Kiyoshi fan, so yes. spinning it back around on you, John, how are you feeling about these rumored films, and do you think it's kind of like the right move for Avatar Studios and Nickelodeon Paramount to make right now? You know, it's interesting. I would love to see anything Avatar Kiyoshi. Yeah. Uh, it does feel like a gamble to make that the first movie, though. I feel like the obvious one would be Zuko, especially because I suspect that that would be the Zuko's mother story, the one right. lingering thread, which right. has been talked about in the comics, but I feel like they will, I feel like they're going to do a movie about that. That feels like the move. Uh, and it feels like that should be for its success's sake, the first one they do. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, if the Avatar Kyoshi movie underperforms, they'll still probably be able to say, oh yeah, but people will go see the Zuko movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people will go see mm -hmm. the Zuko movie. So maybe mm -hmm. they're doing a real smart strategic move here. Um, but as far as the ideas go, three of my top ideas that I want out of this are <laughs> Kyoshi, Zuko, and anything after Korra. Because I love Korra, but it felt like the world changed so much at the end of Korra that I yes. wanted desperately to see what came after it. And oh also, gosh. I'm just a big fan of the Kyoshi books, which kind of establish her origin. And they're so great. And so I, I love the characters in those books, and I want to see them in fully realized and animated. I, that would be oh. so great. That ties into our next newsstand item, John. This is really exciting because we know this, the third book in the Chronicles of the Avatar novel series is going to be coming out next month on July 22nd, and it's called The Dawn of Yang Chen. It's written by F.C. Yi with Avatar co-creator Mike DiMartino working as an advisor on the story, which covers the life of Avatar Yang Chen and her journey from uncertain young woman to revered leader. 
So the question I have for you, John, you've already mentioned them multiple times at this point. Um, <laughs> have you read the first two books in this series, The Rise of Kiyoshi and The Shadow of Kiyoshi? How did you feel about them? And then also, we'll follow up with, are you excited for this third book? And what do we already know about the character of Yang Chen? But let's start with, how did you feel about those first two books? I love those books. I truly, truly love them. I, I've read, I've pretty much consumed everything Avatar that exists. And <laughs> I, I really like the graphic novels, but the books I like more. The, they're the things, they're the only things since the shows that have had me like at the edge of my seat, like page turning, like what Whoa. is next? What's happening next? Whoa. Waiting for the next book to come out. I love those stories. I love the characters. Uh, and it's such a different time in the avatar verse it's really interesting so yes i'm very excited for dawn of yang chen same author so i cannot wait to see how they explore yang chen because you're the expert kind of refresh our listeners memories a little bit you're saying it was a different time period was kiyoshi the last avatar before ang or was it one before that before roku was before Aang. that's right it was so, avatar roku so kiyoshi this is, is one before that how many years before ang's time many. plus not to mention the well, 100 years that he was in the iceberg there's the hundred years he's in the iceberg. Roku lived to be pretty old, and I don't know if you knew this, but Kyoshi lived to be like two hundred something. Sweet. So, so the beginning of this bo- those books, she's like a, she's like a teenager. So it's like hundreds and hundreds wow. years prior to the they, first show. They they got wind of what Star Wars was doing with the High Republic, and they're like, "Yeah, that's cute. Hold my beer. Watch this. <laughs> Boom! Hundreds of years in the past." But that's really really exciting. And then you said it's the same author as those first two books is doing the Dawn of Yang Chen. What do we know about this? Is even further back then this character? Yes. What do we know so, about Avatar Yang Chen? Because Yang Chen is two before Kyoshi. But Whoa. what you learn in these books is that Korik, her the per, the Avatar right before Kyoshi, he didn't live very long. He only lived oh. to be like in his thirties, okay. and uh, and so you learn that Yang Chen was so revered and so loved as an Avatar that Korik had an insanely difficult time living up to that mantle of being the avatar and was actually seen kind of as a failure of an avatar. But there's you get to learn a lot about his history over the course of that. But it will be so interesting to see exactly what Yang Chen did to earn this status as this highly revered avatar. I'm really excited. Yeah, dude, you got me more pumped for the book now, (laughs) even more than before. This is so cool. This is so great. All right, there you have it. Well, John, thanks so much for going through those new stand items with me. Coming up next, we've got an interview with Dante Bosco, a.k.a. Prince Zuko himself, and Janet Varney, a.k.a. Cora, Avatar Cora herself. So stay tuned right after these messages. First question. For both of you, what was your initial impression when you found out that Nickelodeon was like, hey, we want to make an Avatar podcast? It worked out that I, because I went to Nickelodeon and said, can we make an Avatar podcast? What? <laughs> Janet? And they said, actually, it's funny that you would bring this back up because I had brought it up once before. Um, and so it was definitely like very serendipitous that, um, but Janet's that an OG I, podcaster. Janet comes from, <laughs> you know, with the JV club, she was like the first wave of <laughs> podcasters. So yeah. she, she has that, vet, you know, that vet kind of like, that's right. Quality. You could say podcast royalty. I'm very comfortable. Podcast no, royalty. Please don't, please don't say that. OG. Please don't podcast say that. 1.0. Podcast <laughs> 1.0. I'll take podcast maybe 2.0. Um, 2.0. 1.5. Yeah. I'll take 1.5. Uh, so yeah, so that that was uh, that was something that that I re- reached out about, and um, you know we so they were they were like that's really interesting. We're talking about getting into the podcasting space, so um, I I, it, I was very lucky that it worked out the way it did. And I was we ecstatic. I was ecstatic because I became a podcast fan. I mean, I did I did Janet's JV Club, and it was really cool. And I became a podcast fan a bunch of years ago from another voice actor named Chris Sabat. We were at a con and cool. we were having dinner one night and we were, I don't know, we were sitting down, we we're talking about stuff and then he's talking about podcasts. I'm like, I'm not, you know, I never use that app. And it was years ago, right? <laughs> and then he sent me the cereal. He goes, check out this. And he Ooh. sent me the original cereal app and I fell in love with podcasting. And so now I say the last five years or so, I'm probably like 50, 50 with music and podcasts. So many podcasts I follow and listen to and just kind of. I feel like, you know, an adult student just out there 
creating my own syllabus about the things I need to know. <laughs> yes, well Whether said. Whether it be TV shows or true crime, background on musicians. Uh, I have a, quite a list of uh, a podcasts I follow. And so to get a chance to, to do a podcast and now be a host of a podcast, uh, I thank you, Janet Varney. It's pretty it's amazing. It's my absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure, buddy. So you guys are rewatching The Last Airbender for Braving the Elements. Have there been any episodes that you found are your favorite on rewatch or any new ones that surprised you on rewatch that are your new favorites? Well, we have an ongoing <laughs> joke that every episode is our favorite right exactly. after we watch it and every, talk about it. <laughs> the reality is I did the show over 15, 18 years, I don't know, a billion years ago. <laughs> Mike and Brian, you're listening, we did this a, 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 a eons ago. And I'm the kind of actor, I don't really like l- l- watch or do the stuff that I do. Like you yeah. come on to the next thing and the experience of the project is doing the project. And so I never really watched this whole, I mean, of course I've watched episodes through the years, but I've never watched it in chronological order like this. And I have memories of doing it and memories of seeing it here and there, whether it be at a screening or just with some friends. I'm like, oh yeah, this was a cool episode. So really, I mean, as Vani could tell you, like every time I come to an episode, it's like, I've just watched it for the first time. <laughs> and it may be that I did watch it for the first time. <laughs> and so experiencing it visually, because I experienced the whole thing. I mean, I know we saved the world. I was there. I, we, we saved the world. I know that. But to do it as one of the characters in the piece and experience it as a player as to now I mean, is a very unique thing for me. I think for all actors, like who gets to go back and really watch something we've done you know, decades ago and go into detail to into it and, and have, you know, of course, you're never going to lose the experience as the actor, but also have this new layer of experience as just a fan and all the history that's gone on the last 10 plus years and dive into like the meaning of what it is now, and especially with this project, which is so poignant in the days we live in now. Yep. Yep. And so it's really, the conversation has been really wonderful with the past all the artists that worked on the show that's been on the show with us uh, in front of the mic and, and, and behind the, the drawings and, and the music and everything. And then other guests we were able to bring in that are just fans that have impacted them, whether they be social justice people or people that come from different perspectives. The conversation has been, I've been learning so much. We're, tra- <laughs> we're, we're becoming professors of the Avatarverse, me and Varney. <laughs> that's true. It's true. And then now we have this meta experience as well with the podcast where you know, I associate the experience of recording the podcast and talking about the episode totally. so positively that I can't now I can't separate my favorite of having watched the episode or like a particularly <laughs> great recap yeah. or a great discussion or a guest that brings something in that neither of us would have thought of. And so now that's baked in as well. So it's like meta upon meta upon meta, but in such a great way. So like now I have, you know, could are my favorite episodes of the show different than what I would characterize as some of my favorite episodes of the podcast? Probably not. Like, I think yeah. they're, they they kind of right. line up in a way. I think me and Janet are like the Doctor Strange of the Avatarverse. We're living in, like, a multitude of <laughs> universes here. Is there an evil me? <laughs> Please say there's not an evil me. I don't, well, I don't, I do there, might be. Evil me. there might mm, be. There might be. And it I'm continues to go. It's like we have all these different multiverses mm-hmm. going on in our head. And we're like the I, conduits. I, I cannot wait. I'm really looking forward to the Braving the Elements podcast podcast that you guys are going to do 10 years from now. (laughs) We're going to recap and listen to those old episodes. Yeah, recap the recap. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And we'll swap out the guests. So, like, you will be on a (laughs) recap episode of a recap where we had Jason Manzoukas on. Right, right, right. commenting on what he said. It's going to be so good. I cannot wait. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you guys mentioned that you had some, like, great guests on the podcast. And this is the comic-con metapod show so we love to ask this of all of our guests do you guys have any favorite fan interactions or fan moments over the years either at a convention or from even doing this show just like something that first comes to mind when somebody talks about like the fans of specifically avatar and Korra. what comes to mind for you guys i mean there's it's been a (laughs) long time so there's been a lot of wild things that happened over the years i mean there's a bunch of tattoos. I've written mm-hmm. bodies, honor, especially. I've written honor on people's bodies, and then they're, it's tattooed forever. And I'm, That's awesome. And I'm nervous with the Sharpie. Like, are you, are you, are, this is the place? This is where it's going to be? Um, but that's happened. And then just, I, I mean, there's one I told Varney. I, I told on the air recently. I was at New York City Comic Con, and this one young guy was, or I guess he's in his mid-20s. He, he's signing it and he's like, you know, I grew up with you. And I'm like, oh yeah, man, thanks. I, I'm glad that we're all there for you. And, 
and he goes, no, 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 you don't. He got real, like he got real cinematic. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. I go, what? He goes, no, this show, it programmed our generation. Yeah. I said, what? He goes, it programmed our, look around. See all of us? Why do you think Black Lives Matter happened in our generation? Why do you think all the protests (laughs) came back in our generation? Because of this show, you guys programmed us. We're trying to get us back into balance. And I mean, when I had chills going up my neck and I'm looking at this dude, he's looking like he's a young Neo telling me like, Morpheus, you did it. We're, we're, we're on the path. And I'm like, oh my God, are we going to like some crazy Sos and Comet war going on? What's happening? But, wow. it, but th- those kind of things have happened and it really... Well, I mean, Dante, I don't know what you're talking about. There is no war in Ba Sing Se. What are you there's talking no, about? Mm-hmm. There's no war in Ba Sing Se. There's no war in Ba Sing Se. Mm-hmm. There's no war in Ba Sing mm-hmm. no Se. Ba- Everything's you, fine. Don't tell it's that so line. eerie. Don't this is like a Simpsons line. thing where it's like, uh, they, uh, did you guys predict everything that's going to happen? You're like, uh, I, I don't know what Mike and Brian were on. They, were, <laughs> they did somehow. Yeah, there's a, there are just so many um, experiences that um, it's, it's so funny. It's, this is, it feels like it's an oxymoron, but there are so many individual, like, just dr- your yeah. jaw drops, you get chills, your heart, like, b- explodes. Moments that you can't, like, there are too many, and they're right. all individual. It's not like they flow together in the sense that, like, you can't remember one from the other. It's just they're, they're kind of all like that. And yeah. I love yeah. the example that Dante gave. And it's something I've been thinking about <laughs> quite a lot. And without, <laughs> I don't want to wade into politics at all. Other than to say, I think we can all agree that our country is um, in a really strange, broken place right now. And yep. um, it's hard to know what to do, whatever you believe. And I have spent an inordinate amount of time like self-soothing by hearkening back to the many cons that you know Dante and I have done together that we've done separately that we then talk about together where I really do think if nothing else I know that that generation is going to be take they're going to take care of the earth and they may not be able to be president today but I really believe having had those interactions and having had them all over the world with dear wonderful culturally diverse you know, non-judgmental, compassionate people that no matter what's happening in the moment, I'm like, there is no way we backslide with that generation. There is no way. And it has carried me through some of the hardest moments of the last couple of years, truly (laughs) from the bottom of my heart. And I'll tell you guys, if you guys are ever at a con with Janet Varney, which I've been next to her many cons, it's not uncommon to to look to the side and she's moved to tears, boy. Yep. There's something yep. happening. And I'm not party to all those interactions, but it's some heavy stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. like, are you cool? Are you good? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, same old, same old. Great day at I'm work. in it. I'm in it, baby. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> For sure. Well, speaking of being moved to tears, both The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra have an abundance of emotional sequences. Um, Some of my favorite in television history, honestly. I kind of wanted to flip the script, ask you guys opposite. Janet, do you have a favorite emotional scene from The Last Airbender? And Dante, do you have a favorite emotional scene from Legend of Korra? Yeah, don't make him answer Legend of Korra okay. because I'm still not, catching. Yeah, not steeped. I'm saving. He's so deeply steeped <laughs> in totally, in Avatar totally. that yeah, I, like if you asked me, I would Korra. be like, oh I'm my gosh, a yeah. lot of Korra till we get to Korra in, yeah. the, in the podcast. I've watched episodes through the years, but I've, yeah. again, mm-hmm. I've never watched all of them in sequential it's, it's, order. And it's, like, it's a different experience to do these shows in that order. It's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. So right. yeah, that's going to be But just awesome. on a quick note, I do know I saw the end of the last episode of Korra uh, like everybody else. Yeah. And when the Korasami thing happened, I was really kind of touched. And even beyond that, when I read on Tumblr the next day that he yep. because I'm a big Tumblr person, especially in those days, and um, when, they, when Brian made it canon on Tumblr, I was like, Oh my God, I can't <laughs> believe this happened. And that really blew me away. And I have so much respect for Mike and Brian and just the way that kind of happened and made it real. It really, that really kind of affected me in a very deep way. You know what? Awesome. You totally had a perfect answer. I should not have even jumped in and been like, don't make him comb <laughs> through all the episodes. Cause you're right. That's like one of the most kind of paramount moments um, of, of that show. I mean, we have definitely had a lot, you know, 
D, you don't know this because you were shooting a movie. Actually, you were shooting a series of movies because you're a star. But um, <laughs> Hector sat in with me for The Swamp. And oh, wow. that... So that episode came out recently on the podcast, and I talk about, on every episode of the podcast you're not on, I just talk about you and do impressions of you as if you're there, so uh, people may not even realize you're gone, but, um, (laughs) no, but we, you know, so we talked a lot about you, and I was saying, like, oh, you've spared Dante another episode of Braving uh, Braving Up Elements where I'm crying, because, you know, we have this, like, very deep very beautiful stuff that gets said in that episode by our swamp monster who says time is an illusion so is death and i mean i just sat there with tears streaming down my face just like when i watched the episode then when we talked yeah. about it i hear t- yeah. had tears streaming down my face and, and, and then it, hector brought up iron giant why did i do that internet, why did i bring up the, the iron so giant happy slash angry with you i know we've gotten so many people who responded like <laughs> why did you have to bring up iron giant on top of this moment that already happened in avatar <laughs> like i can't take it the feels Oof, the, the feels. feels i was like i'm the there feels. with you baby John knows too. I, I mean, I, I think Janet, I cried on that episode of your guys's podcast more than I've ever publicly been recorded as crying in my life. <sighs> oh, like I've choked up doing honor. other shows and stuff and things, but like that was the one where I think I lost I it. It was keep it together. great. I keep <laughs> and you together. do bring up the Iron Giant a lot. All the time. John <laughs> All knows. The time. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Wish we going out to get something to eat and I'll just be like, you know who else loves to eat? Metal. The Iron Giant. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Oh, so good. All the time. So good. So you guys were talking about the future of the podcast of Avatar Braving the Elements. I don't know if you can announce it yet. I don't know if you even know, but have they told you guys that you're greenlit for book three for The Legend of Korra? Plus, they're coming up with all this new stuff. So you guys have the job security for like 20 years, right? Like how, like how far out in the planning have they told you that you're good to go? Well, it's like a... Wait, so it's one of those things... How do I say this? I feel like um, the intention and what we understand to be true as the intention is absolutely to exist through Korra and well into the other shows. And by the way, that's something that I have thought a lot about in terms of when the movies do start airing. Like, I don't think that we are going to be able to just like wait Skip until the end well oh. no i think we might have to because i think we need to be you know we want to talk about it when everyone else sees it and talks about it so there cool. may be right. a situation in which we do press pause on cora if that's where you are or we do press pause on book three of of avatar depending on when things roll out to where we're just gonna have to like jump in because w- what are we to do tell people like enjoy that we'll talk to you in three years about it no <laughs> so um that'll be a fun kind of interesting like maybe we continue when we put out an an additional episode a week. I don't know. This is not something we talked about with Nickelodeon at all. Uh, But I know that they want the universe to be present in the same way that it's going to be for everyone else on the podcast. Um, But what you're saying is you guys are going to do this show regardless. Whether or not they tell you you can't. It's going to be doing it. Whether we get that cease and desist letter or not, uh, (laughs) we're going to be doing it. No, but, you know, but having said that, at the same time, you know, they were very, they took great joy in announcing that we were picked up for our second season of the podcast. So it's one of those things where, you know, yeah. the expectation for everyone is everyone loves the show and everyone loves talking about the show. So if all goes well, yes, we will be doing this for many, many years. Yet at the same time, we respect and honor Nickelodeon's ability to, you know, make it official every season and, you know, work hard to make sure that the podcast is, you know, finding new ears all the time and all that. So it's like a it's like a happy medium of all that. I'm sure the answer is that you can't tell us, but <laughs> there are a lot of rumors right now uh-huh. going around. Anything new in the Avatar verse? You don't have to say anything. You can just wink if you want. I, I, we really <laughs> don't know. That's a real. They're not telling us. Dante, they, come on, Dante. They told us earlier that they're doing films. They didn't even tell us what films they're doing. Obviously, a lot of things dropped, and it's a lot of interesting news going on. I mean, look, me and me and Barney are Avatar family for life, so we just want to see everything go well. Uh, and again, we don't know. You know how animation is. It takes time for them to do s- stuff and write stuff and animate stuff yep. and voice stuff. It's like, I don't think people understand like the years it takes to even make one project. And they did, ex- you know, when I say they, I say Michael Bryan did explain how hard it is to create movies, which is different than doing the series. So mm. I, we don't, we don't know. We have, we all, like everyone else, we have a lot of trust in those guys. So we'll, we'll stand, stand by and see what happens. 
to let you guys off the hook, officially, officially off the hook, this is not an official answer from you guys, but rather just you as fans going off of that. Is there anything that you would love to see because the Avatar verse is so rich with possibilities? Are there any specific characters or stories that you guys would love to see explored in the future? That's tough because I think, you know, I am a fan. I love animation and I love seeing things on the screen and I love, you know, listening to the voice actors do their thing. And yet I also love the books and the comics. Um, so I'm sure the conversation is happening. I'm not sure, but I would imagine the conversation has happened from the very inception of Avatar Studios of do we make the comics come to life as animation or do right, we let them right. stand as their own stories and do something completely different and spin off something else um, and I don't know the answer to that I would be perfectly happy with either but I would certainly love to see and I think you know Dante and I have talked about this too is like well, of course we would love to see you know what happens with Zuko's mom not just uh, on the page um, but having said that again you know it's there's so many characters from the show that I would be perfect I mean right. listen if they wanted to do a movie about the cabbage merchant I would be like I'm showing up <laughs> for that I cannot wait there would be a line around the corner you know what I mean like I'm in I it, would, it would gross more than Endgame for that's sure right. <laughs> that's yeah, right <laughs> my own selfish thing would be one of my favorite characters is Uncle Iroh yes. like a lot of people out there Yes. and I love where he is in the show and, and of course how much he impacts Zuko's life but the, to get where he got to as this like you know, just sageful uncle, everyone's mm -hmm. favorite uncle. I mean, he had to go on a journey also because he yeah. was a dragon of the West in probably the fiercest time of the Fire Nation. And of course he lost his son. We know, we know certain things about his backstory, but I would really love to go back in and do a dragon of the West show or, oh. or yeah. movie oh. and you get to see you know, it's almost like the Darth Vader. Yeah, like, you, we don't it's kind know. Kind of scary. I mean, it's he a, was it's... probably one of the most powerful firebenders. He could have been taking out Ozai. What what happened? What did he do to become Man. the Dragon of the West? Yeah. And how did he fight that pull to you know the dark side or whatever you want to look at it and became this other guy? That, I love uh, that. That led his, his nephew. Dante, I almost want to ask you to stop pitching that because I will be disappointed if it <laughs> I doesn't know, happen. I know, I know. It's so good. It's so Isn't good. But the is, perfect it's, show title. Dragon I know. of the West. Dragon, Dragon of the West. West. It's so that was good. Hot. It's so good. But what a challenge because, you know, we do love our anti-heroes and we love, you know, we, we've talked so much, um, especially recently, Azula has been very much on the minds oh. of many of the people at the cons that we've talked to. There's a whole generation of people who have met her for the first time and are really troubled by the fact that she seems irredeemable in some way unredeemable irredeemable i feel like it's irredeemable i don't know but uh but so this idea of like how much like azula is your young iroh and you know it's hard to see people that you first meet after yeah. redemption and yeah. then be forced to confront it's one thing to hear about it in the past it's another to see it in the past and be like oh no yeah, what, yeah, this what, is what tough. Did, you know? What did Iroh have or what did he go through that Azula did not? That's right. the, you know, yeah, that's great. And to see the pendulum swing. Because if we mm -hmm. see this pendulum swung on this side, you, you obviously know if it goes this over here, it has to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somewhere on the other side. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what about you guys? Oh. <laughs> Listen, that's John, a big question, Jim. I think John has done multiple <laughs> YouTube videos on it. I feel like John would be, John, What's your? what would be your number one? What would be your number one? If you had to pick one. Um, well, I would have said Kiyoshi before, but these books have been so good. Right. And mm. I I'm still want to see more from Kiyoshi. I would like him to go forward into the future. I, I liked how Korra became a little more steampunk. It would be cool if they moved even a little more cyberpunk, like a little mm -hmm. further up. Um, Is that, you find that to be different. a controversial cyberpunk thing? Cyberpunk Kiyoshi Warriors. I think it is. I, I don't that. think it's as loved by most fans, the idea of moving further into the future. Yeah. But I, I feel it. like you can really do a lot with nature versus technology in that kind of yeah, world. Yeah, absolutely. Which, like, you know, bending versus weapons and that kind of stuff. Sure. John, John, I got your back. I'm a fan. I got your back. I want that pitch. I would love like a Blade Runner set in the Ooh. Avatar verse. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Love that. So cool. I think <laughs> I think my number one most desired idea, though, would if you did an anthology show where every episode is about a different avatar. So Love we get to it. explore oh. a lot of different ones. Love yeah. it. Love That'd it. That would be great. That yeah. would be really cool. And I know, knowing John, you guys can take those ideas, 
right to Mike and Brian if you want. Uh-huh, totally, that's right. you can. That's you can. That's right. <laughs> that's the pipeline. They, yeah, no, they. We have an open line that where it's it's just almost like a police scanner where we just have it piping into Mike and Brian's office at all times. Yep. Whatever conversations we're having, they'll just mm-hmm. you know they're just they're hearing it right now. They're hearing it live. Outside of other stories, are there any other mediums you'd like to see Avatar explored in? Other video games, Mm. stage musical, pinball Mm -hmm. machines, Mm -hmm. anything? (laughs) Well, I recently just played... Number one, pinball, for sure. (laughs) Pinball would be great. But I just recently played the uh, the RPG, the official RPG of the game, (gasps) which was really cool and... uh, it was so fun. I mean, you know, back to the D&D days and creating a character, but, you know, the classes of characters, you know, are, of course, fire, water, earth, were, and, Did you uh, Were you a firebender? Were you a firebender, Dante? Of course. I was Fire Nation. Else? Fire okay. Nation forever. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Fire Nation <laughs> forever. You're asking I the created leader a character of the Fire Nation. Nation. I know, I know. I know. No, no, there's no, there's no avatars in it, because, you know, the avatars in the, in the campaign, it's like, come on. Yeah. The, you're good. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I created a guy named Ezra. That was kind of he had his own had, little had, little Note that on. he added that Z. He made had sure to have a Z. Come on, you had to have a Z in his name. He knows his stuff. <laughs> uh, but that was really cool. I mean, going to the RPG world was really cool. I mean, of course, more video games would be great. Like more, you know. It just I love you know as a gamer, kind of going to that world and get to play these characters and, and using the elements would be fun. Um, but that being said, pinball would be fun also. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not a huge, like, 2D gamer, if you will, but um, I do have an Oculus, and I, and I think it would be Oof. really fun to really just be in that world. I don't necessarily need to, like, even win points, but, like, to solve, like, puzzles and just be able to walk through the various tribes and um, interact with some of the hybrid animals, like, in, a, in that kind of VR way. Um, I think would maybe almost explode my brain, but I think it would be worth it because it would be really, really fun. Yeah, VR would be fantastic. So before we let you guys go, we've got a couple of questions here from some uh, LA Comic Con fans through their social media. This is a social media question. This one is for Janet. Janet, you've said in an interview with Fandom.com that you didn't know about Korra's sexuality until halfway through The Legend of Korra. So question is, after hearing the news, were there any points in the show where you like adjusted your lines or delivery to reflect that aspect of her character? Well, you know, the if we look back on uh, seasons three and four, there was so much going on nonstop and characters yeah. were being separated from one another. And the you know, Mike and Brian were very vocal about, you know, they didn't want because the because they were teenagers and because they sort of met at the time that they did, and I'm speaking also of you know Bolin and Mako and everybody, um, they didn't want it to become a relationship show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may be misquoting. I feel like I'm not. I feel like they've been pretty open about that. And so they did um, they did want to make sure that this sort of in a sense that there wasn't time. Um, and so there, I don't feel like there were a ton of opportunities to tailor that because it was just 90 miles an hour through what you know Korra and the gang were having to deal with in with Zaheer and with Kuvira Um, and so by the time we started getting into you know Korra writing her letter to Asami and Korra alone in in book four uh, in the first episode um, you know there was there was stuff happening there but we were like leaning in towards the end of the series by then so the answer is no but I don't I can't give an answer of like what it would have been like had there been more opportunities to do that right for sure Dante you've typically played heroes in your past Uh, Zuko when he started off not so heroic how did you get into the headspace to play a character like Zuko yeah I didn't think he was I didn't know he was a hero no idea (laughs) (laughs) I thought he was a strange looking villain <laughs> on a, a kid show on Nickelodeon with scars. I actually thought I was the Wiley Coyote. I was like, Mike Bryan, I, I'm never going to catch this guy, right? <laughs> I, I mean, it's been like a season and I'm, I might want to catch this guy. I want to catch this guy. And then I'm, I'm Wiley Coyote. It's been like 50 years and that guy hasn't caught the Roadrunner ever. So I, I just went with that. I mean, really at the time, honestly, I was I was doing American Dragon Jake Long for Disney 
and me and Mae Whitman were both doing that show and mm -hmm. we started doing Avatar so I was like oh cool I could be a hero on Disney and I could be a villain on Nickelodeon that's awesome and then as we went through the story I really was just taking it episode to episode I didn't even really have any force I never thought like oh I'm gonna become a hero people were always like we knew you're gonna be a hero I was like I had no clue I like <laughs> I was just trying to be a good actor in the moment trying to fulfill you know that day's scene work and I loved working with Mako who originally played Uncle Iroh because we, we worked together so many times throughout our career he was you know he played my uncle and my father several times throughout my career so I was just really vibing where we were in the story yeah and then somewhere around book two when I you know you realize how he got scarred and then you realize how he when he cut his ponytail off then it started going oh mm. this is I'm gonna have to teach this this avatar firebending I'm gonna have to do it, right? <laughs> it's gotta be me. Yeah. And uh, so, I guess you know, as an actor, I think people love the performance, and I look back at it, and I, I'm almost kind of like so detached from it. Like my memories of it was like, I don't know what was going on in my life. I mean, I do. There was things going on in my life that mirrored what was Zuko was going on. So I, I love how it kind of through osmosis got into the character. But I was really living it like you're supposed to do it. Like, live, you know, when you're doing a series, you're like living it day to day. Like, that, don't know so much. Don't play the end. Yeah. You don't have to play the end. That's yeah. a not great, there. That's a great follow-up, too. It's like, yeah, I, I'm glad I didn't know sooner because, you know, you want, it, you want to be with the character on their right. journey and not trying to steer something in a certain direction because you or have Or wink knowledge. at the audience, yeah. like, don't mm -hmm. worry. Mm -hmm. We're going to yeah. be. Right. I'm gonna, I had no, I was not playing any of that stuff. Like, when he messed up, I was like, oh, well, he's, he's, he's going... <laughs> he's going dark side, I guess. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. He's following Azula. Yeah. Yep. Whatever. Bad idea, but it is what it uh -huh. is. It's <laughs> awesome. Well, the last question we've got for you guys is we want to talk about the music of the Avatar verse, of Avatar The Last Airbender, The Legend of Korra. We love the music. We love the score. We love that soundtrack. Do you guys have a favorite scene featuring your character that you felt was really emotionally amplified by the music? Oh. I mean, all of them, all of the moments all the time are. And that was one of the most fun episodes I think we've had from a behind the scenes point of view is having yeah. Jeremy Zuckerman on um, and, and having Ben Wynn on because they both worked on the, the main theme and, you know, they're both very musical, yet they also were doing sound sound design uh, right. as well. And they yeah. were as, as anybody. And their story's so crazy. It's their first yeah. show they did. Yeah. They, might, they were all friends. And they were going like... to trade like season by season, like they were going to trade back and forth on sound design and, and uh, soundtrack. And then they were like, oh. we're crazy. We can't do this. Like they were. Every, <laughs> we didn't like, even know what we were doing this. No, we were making knew. stuff up as we went along. Yeah, we were like, it's much. so perfect. Very much. Wow. But, you know, the, having Rishi, uh, her way from, from Song Exploder on the episode as well with the first time we had Jeremy on and really talking about, you know, the, the sort of love theme and that the last closing kind of song from Korra um, and that there's this wonderful, um, very short, very listenable, can't recommend it enough Song Exploder episode um, that Rishi did about that song and talking to Jeremy, uh, which came out years ago, is it is so moving. And um, I was big surprise crying as I listened to that episode and listened to them talk about it and listening to the music itself. So that's the one that really pops up for me, for sure. Wow. And for me, I think it's, you know, the thing is, again, like I tell you, we, we, we told the story through playing the characters out almost in a radio play kind of way, doing the lines and learning the story and being impacted that way. Mm -hmm. And going back to watch episodes through the years, uh, it's, I mean, it's the music and the visuals hitting you at the same time. It's, I almost can't kind of like disconnect them from each other. But like, you know, the, the dragon dance, that episode, being it, playing it and knowing what happened and then seeing what they d did with the visuals and the colors and the music and the swelling of everything. And, and then just Aang and Zuko back to back, just being in awe of like what's going on. I was like, wow, this is, it's a whole nother level of an experience that, I didn't experience it the first time playing the scene. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Well, guys, just along with everything that's happening with Avatar Studios, the future of the franchise, let's throw this in there too, Nickelodeon Paramount. Let's get some official releases of all that gorgeous music yeah. fans have been yeah. asking for for years. Uh, every season, every book, every series, everything. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> let's make that happen. Because uh, we will give you our monies, uh -huh. Nickelodeon. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the yes, thing. Yes, indeed. Guys, I want to thank you both for joining us for this chat and getting to geek out about Avatar and Korra. 
John, thanks for coming along with me, man. You had some great questions. That was so much fun. Um, thanks for inviting me. Of course, man. Braving the Elements, Avatar, colon, Braving the Elements podcast is out every single week where you can get your podcasts. And, uh, you know, be sure to be following Janet and Dante for all the future Avatar stuff, which I'm sure they're going to be very excited about. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you guys so Thanks, much. This guys, was this fantastic. Is so much. Fun. Oh, loved so it. fun. Thank you guys so much. Coming up next, we've got Jeremy Zuckerman, one half of the track team, composer for Avatar and Korra, who's going to share some insights about his Avatarverse music. So stick around for more Comic Con Metapod right after this. First question, cool. just a real easy one, Jeremy. An impossible question. Do you have a favorite episode of Avatar? Do you have a favorite episode of The Legend of Korra? Um, it changes from like year to year, but I think right now my favorite Avatar episode, strangely enough, Appa's Lost Days. Wonderful. Great. Wonderful yeah, episode. Yeah, there's not a lot of text or dialogue in that. Sorry, voice voice actors, <laughs> but D. Bradley Baker brought it. But um, I love that episode. I love the tone and I just love that it's sort of like mesmerizing and I just love that episode. It's a fantastic, you it's know? a fantastic episode yeah. and, and, and a, a great example of, it's a great episode to showcase like why that show is different than other cartoon shows, frankly, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, it's, mm -hmm. it's not only is the rest of the series so good, but you get to that episode and you're like, I can't believe that they pulled this off right in the middle of the, you know, just wonderful. There's exactly you nailed it there's so many moments like that in the show where it's like i can't believe they pulled this <laughs> off <laughs> this one might be a bit tougher uh because okay. it's more about your work whereas this is the other question is about the show itself but do you have a single piece of music that's your favorite that you've composed for the for either show that is tougher i don't think i have a favorite but probably one of my favorite moments is the azula's mirror I really love that whole scene and I just feel like everything worked really well. You know, um, it just feels like it was a really strong scene and the music was really serving it well. And I also had a fun time with the music in that scene because we had um, live uh, string ensemble uh, for, for those last four episodes. Yep, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, and it was so much fun because I was trying all kinds of things that I hadn't really tried before. And I remember like doing this stuff with like all the sort of microtonal strings, but it was like actually really specific. And they were like, you know, ridiculous. The expectations were actually kind of silly because they would be like, I don't know if, you know, to the people who don't know this, often music is sort of like a, a step of, you know, if you look at a key on the piano and you go from one key to the next, that's like a hundred cents often. It's divided into something called cents, right? And that's how you deal with microtones. And then a half of that 50 cents would be a quarter step, mm. right? Which we don't have on the piano. It'd be a, a perfect interval between those two keys. Got it. But I was doing things with like 10.7 cents and re and they were just like, the players were like, um, do you want us to play exactly? And I was like, no, just know that it's slightly sharp here, almost a quarter tone <laughs> here, you know, beyond a quarter. And, uh, but it worked really well. It was like super fun. I don't think I've ever done that since because I don't want to get beaten up by the players. I think they were like, what is this clown? But it was fun. It was a fun experiment and it actually worked well because like, I had mocked it up with a computer, you know, and so it actually sounded really similar but better because it was real. Um, so that's one of my favorite. And then, um, of course, like Last Agnikai, I just love because it's like such a simple piece and it resonates so much with people. Yeah. That's like a really good example of like, sometimes, you know, less is more and don't try to shred all over the place. <laughs> sort of the opposite of the mirror one, <laughs> you know, uh, those were a couple. I'm going to, I'm going to flip around the order of these questions a little bit, John, because the next one I want to ask is, Jeremy, can you tell us about the future of the Avatar verse, if anything, can you even say if you're involved with anything that Avatar Studios that we know that they're currently working on? I, I am definitely informally involved. I haven't signed anything. Um, it would be very, you know, crazy if it, you know I weren't involved. That would be weird. Like yep. I died or something. Yep. Or I went, you know, <laughs> lost my hearing. <laughs> um, or you know, Brian and Mike just decide they don't like me anymore. Um, but I, I, you know, we're brothers. <laughs> all of us <laughs> i don't know what i could do i'm sure i could do something but i'm going to try not to do anything to screw it up um but yeah yeah i mean i think it's going to be you know putting the band back together you know that's awesome um, okay so yeah then that leads into this next question john 
I want you to ask this one right there at the th yeah, here. Yeah. You know which one I'm talking about? This one right here? You I got it? Okay, got okay, you, okay. I got you. Here we go. So one thing I really liked about the music in The Legend of Korra is since, uh, since it pushed the series forward a few decades, you were able to sort of compose in a little bit more modern styles of music. You did, you know, there's some jazzy tracks in the Republic City stuff. Mm -hmm. Are there any other styles of music you'd like to play in the Avatar verse, era permitting? Sure, I would love to experiment with electronics a bit um, and computer music. I think that would be really interesting in the Avatar world. Like, how would that even work? But I'm sure we could find a way. I think, you know, other than that, I mean, we've done so much. We've done such a range. We've done, you know, a lot of sort of non-Western music which has been incredibly challenging and excellent. And I, I like that idea to sort of continue down that road and find players and other people that I could learn from and collaborate with in that you know regard. Um, but yeah, I'm really like, I, my background, you know, before I started all this was computer music, strangely enough. <laughs> um, and I haven't done a ton of it for work, although I keep like tinkering away in my, you know, crazy world. And it would be really nice to sort of bring those two worlds together and see what happens. I've done a little bit of that, but it would be really interesting in the Avatar world because it's so lush and there's so much going on, you know, there's so much, so much detail. I've always um, thought so. if they jumped forward into an even more futuristic setting where you get sort of a cyberpunk world, that feels like that would fit pretty well if they did that. Yeah, absolutely. Some kind of future settings for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that could work. So Jeremy, with Avatar Studios being announced uh, now, what was it, like February of 2021 and all of this stuff starting to get going and some announcements of, you know, the, the future films and everything that's happening, this kind of resurgence, it feels like. I, 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 I'm sure that I brought this up to you before. I'm sure you get it all the time, Jeremy. How close do you think we are now to getting more official releases of Avatar and Korra music? So every time I answer this question, people get really mad at me because <laughs> I answer it and then three years go by. I know. <laughs> but I really think we're, we're getting close. Yes. Um, I don't want to say anything too specific, but this is the best it's ever looked by a long shot. So Man. I've had the Legend of Korra season one soundtrack in my car for years. Yeah. <laughs> Aww, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I really, I know it's such unfinished business, you know. It's just yeah. like we have to get the rest of it out. Yeah. I'd love to get all of it out. It's you know, it's so. unfinished business. It's also like, man, it's opportunities for. I'm I'm just a huge fan of of all film and television music, and I love you know getting to see Michael Giacchino go on tour with like the Lost music. Even though that series is now mm -hmm. ended all these years later, it's just there's now even opportunities for like let's revisit that music. Let's have the full orchestration. Absolutely. Let's do special releases of of new recordings of the music. All of that, in my mind, is on the table. And Jeremy, what you just said, like, made my day, sir. I am so stoked <laughs> well, to hear that news. <laughs> I appreciate that. I think there's a, there's some really, there's some exciting stuff um, that I'm hoping, you know, actually happens. But there's there's some there's some stuff happening. You know, there's some stuff behind this, the machinations going on. It's you're, you're doing a, you're doing a great job, not getting in any trouble, but still like filling us with hope. This is great. This is I really, hope yeah. so. I hope so. <laughs> so as I just kind of mentioned, I've always loved the music of Legend of Korra. Been in my car for a while, uh, Thank you. but listening to the Legend of Korra music in particular, I've always just wondered what man. I can't believe this guy isn't scoring big blockbuster movies. Like this music is so big and so great. Any chance we'll be hearing? these themes in movie theaters soon any anything <laughs> happening uh well I, I believe there was an announcement about some avatar features planned so that could certainly happen yeah. um and that would be quite amazing to really do it with a budget and you know an orchestra I'm, yeah i'm hoping this happens uh, i don't know for sure but i really that's sort of the the goal for me at least to realize this musical world you know on a bigger scale and i think it would be you know that's always sort of what it wanted to be and i don't i don't think it would be a stretch in the least i think it'd be very simple for it to be suddenly you know all it takes is you know many thousands of dollars that's all <laughs> it's yeah that's it that's all it takes many many thousands and thousands of dollars and yeah. jeremy i could just picture a potential future where fans like john and myself are sitting in a theater and I'm not kidding you, dude. The first note of some music, we are going to lose it. We're just, it's going to, like, huh. We're just going to just immediately tears. <laughs> oh, man. The, the expectations are high. Well, it's uh. it's funny because, you know, we talked to Janet and Dante, and we're talking to Brian and Mike, and it does feel like right now we're on this this 
precipice of we're about to see so much Avatar stuff. I just hope that you guys know, and John and I are in the position, like we get to say as fans, like the fans are behind you guys. And it's and it's this it's this incredible like feeling of excitement. I would love to ask you, Jeremy, because this is the Comic-Con Metapod podcast. Do you have a favorite fan interaction or fan moment, whether it's from making an appearance at a convention or just everyday life? There's definitely some that have stayed with me for sure. There was, uh, man, <laughs> it's pretty emotional. There was this, this one guy who um, wrote me this email that he was gay and he was scared to tell his parents. And he listened to, I think, The Greatest Change from cor the chorus Jeremy, track, and he got Jeremy, pumped and John, he went and told his John parents. mentioned that track before we started recording. <laughs> really? Wow. Oh. Uh, and then he and then he well, and then he told his parents. That's beautiful. Then he told his parents and they were cool. They were cool and then he felt amazing and he he like emailed me and I was just like, Wow, this is so much bigger <laughs> than I could have ever imagined and it's beyond us. And it's bigger than us. And I'm just so like God, I can't believe I get to be a part of this. Like what a weird existence, you know? <laughs> but yeah, that was pretty powerful. That was pretty powerful. Um, that's probably, maybe that's the best. And then, you know, there's been people who have said they were, you know, struggling with depression and they listen to music and it helps them and things like that. And that's just, whew, that's, that's like, that's a big deal, it, you know? It's crazy. It's crazy, but I totally feel all of that. Yeah. So this is maybe a question for you as more of a fan uh the avatar verse is so expansive there's so much that they could explore in that world it's so rich and big are there any other characters or stories that you'd like to see explored upcoming uh through avatar studios um i'm afraid to answer this because i'm afraid <laughs> it might seem like i'm giving something away or if it happens they'll think it, someone might get mad at me at avatar studios or nickelodeon well, <laughs> even if i don't if i'm just we, guessing and throwing names well, out there. let's do this let's let you off the hook and instead okay. we'll turn back and we'll look at everything that's already come out and we'll just ask you jeremy as a fan do you have a favorite character or story in the avatar or Korra series that have already come out so this has nothing to do with the future but just you as a fan what's what's something that you that really spoke to you and you really liked i think i really liked the whole actually i really like that cave of two lovers myth the myth, you know, that, that it's sort of like just a one or two minute um, explanation of what happened with these lovers. And then she took revenge and then she decided, you know, she separated or whatever. And um, I love that whole moment. And I love the, uh, the aesthetic of it as well. Um, that could be interesting. I don't know if it could, you know, warrant a whole series, <laughs> but <laughs> it'd be, it could, you know, maybe there's something there. Um, but I'm definitely not a writer. So I, I don't know, but I always love that that a lot. Um, I also that was I think the first time I used the Gujian. I got it at, at Nam, the you know um, the music mess, and uh, I didn't really know how to use it yet. And I have a friend who says whenever you get a new instrument, like record yourself like the first time you ever use it, because that's going to be like the most interesting thing you ever do with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's kind of true at least with that. You know, it was like yeah, it's kind of true because then I learned. I took lessons and you know, I got more conventional in the way I play it. And I don't think I would have done the things I had done, you know, after having some knowledge, not like knowledge is bad at all, but yeah, that was one of those situations. So yeah, I definitely have some affinity to that whole little moment, it, it, you know, 90 seconds. It's the thing we keep hearing too, as fans that like, especially with the braving the elements podcast that is going back and reexamining those, those, th that initial season, that first, you know, uh, a group of episodes and all of you guys coming together that it seems like it's a lot of you guys behind the scenes being like, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're doing it. And here's the first 13. <laughs> and now here's the first season and we're rolling into book two and just like, but that's, you know, some of that real interesting yep. stuff all comes from there. It's jazz, baby. <laughs> but, I mean, and we were young, you know, we we're so young. We were just figuring it out, learning as we went. Yeah. So, so Avatar has now been two series. There's some books, graphic novels, and these movies are coming up. Uh, are there any other mediums you'd like to see Avatar explored in? Have Have they ever considered a stage musical? SpongeBob got one. <laughs> That'd be cool. Or I'm not a huge fan of musicals, um, believe it or not. <laughs> My mom and I used to joke about that, like how they would just sort of everything would drop and become super dramatic. Like he opened the door. He opened the door. He opened the door. You know. <laughs> 
Uh, I, I, but, now, but, now I feel like some of your feelings towards musicals found their way into the show. Is is what well, I'm thinking now, Jeremy? That's is is that is that you influencing Brian and Mike? And be like, hey, can you guys make fun of these uh, musical theater people a little bit? <laughs> no, not at all. I never. That was not me at all. That's so funny. But um, but uh, um, uh, maybe yeah. I think it would be fun to do like a, a concert tour. It might be really cool. You know. Um, with like be there. <laughs> some kind of abbreviated avatar experience or something, you know, where you sort of get the whole arc in a night, you know, and uh, I could see that being really nice for the fans too. I mean, you sort of have to be a fan, I think, to really enjoy it. Otherwise it might not make a ton of sense, but uh, maybe that's something, maybe there's something there. I, think you, I you know? think you guys would be able to find people who'd buy tickets for that. I think it would be pretty <laughs> successful. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was that was fantastic, Jeremy. Thank you so much for chatting with us. I feel like I, the the last sort of question I have uh, that we have for this podcast and for you taking some time and, and chatting with us. And by, again, by the way, you did do a great job of not revealing anything. But <laughs> man, I'm stoked Good. about what's coming down the line because it sounds cool. fantastic. Uh, but just if, if you know, you guys are working behind the scenes. You're in the trenches right now. You get to see fans and have those experiences if they're sending you these great emails or if you happen to make it to a convention. But like it's sometimes tough to see, you know, that fan excitement um, as you guys are working because you guys are, 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 are working so hard and, and trying to produce this stuff. What would be the thing that you would say to fans? I mean, looking back at, at the fandom up to this point, but also looking forward, what would you say to fans? You know, take this opportunity and just let them know whatever you'd like to share with them. Um, I think I'd like to let them know that that their sort of experience of this whole thing has made it so much bigger than what it was in the beginning. And they infused so much deeper meaning into the whole thing. Um, and it's been really kind of an amazing ride. It really does feel, even though, like you said, you know, we're pretty sort of isolated from direct experience with them. Um, I feel like there's been this amazing feedback loop and it's just like made everything better you know it's made the show better because of it awesome uh john anything else you wanted to ask jeremy zuckerman right now while we have him <laughs> no i think i got it all but but just thank you thank you for your work this this is some of my favorite uh some of my favorite compositions ever in these shows so thank wow. you wow well, yeah thank you so much um it was really great to talk to you both Coming up next, we've got Brian Konitzko and Michael DiMartino, the creators and executive producers of Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, and the chief creative officers of the newly established Avatar Studios. So stick around for more Comic-Con Metapod right after this. Cool. Well, our first question... Uh, how did Avatar Studios happen? Was this something Mike, you guys were Mike's thinking fault. about and it's pitched, or did fault. they approach you? <laughs> yeah, how do we answer that one? That's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit my fault. It was a little bit of both, maybe. There was there was a, a show that will not be named uh, that we left, and as we were figuring out our next steps, um, you know, there, there's new leadership over at. Nickelodeon. This was a couple years ago now. Mm -hmm. Brian Robbins and Ramsey Naito. Uh, and they were big Avatar fans and saw a lot of potential in the franchise and started talking to us, seeing what we wanted to do. Uh, yeah, oh. I maybe foolishly said, why don't we just come and oversee the whole, the whole <laughs> thing, the whole shebang? Because here's the thing with Avatar, there's a lot of different things going on. So there's, you know, even though the shows were over, we were doing still doing graphic novels there were ya novels coming out there was video games going on there's always been consumer products and like we were sometimes involved in some of that stuff but not all of it so this just seemed like the the best way to to just come in and and help oversee the direction of the franchise and into the future on all fronts so yeah it went sort of like they were really excited about getting us back and brian robbins i remember he kept saying think big <laughs> think big and it was like they were just like we want you guys to do whatever you want and mike just goes how about we get our own studio and they were like okay and uh <laughs> so that's sort of how it happened it was that easy. i keep saying like i keep saying like once we got into it i was like mike we kind of have grown-up jobs now <laughs> like how did how did this happen and, and um so it's really effectively it's it's like 
there's a kind of pot like we call it the pod it's sort of like the core of like our main sort of producing partners and people that are in in the team helping us manage all of this stuff and and then we have uh we're setting up productions and and those will sort of actually be it's it's like a studio within a studio you know i mean it's it's we we always say it's like a mini mini marvel within a disney or something you know <laughs> the idea being we're producing avatar related stuff and and um that's really what we're doing but we're doing that within the nickelodeon paramount you know sort of ecosystem so uh super exciting and we really appreciate ramsey and brian's support and enthusiasm and they were they were actually like really familiar with the shows and and even some of the extra like books and stuff wow. and, and um so it was, it, was, it was cool and they they uh would tell us that you know i mean now we're not young anymore and and we went back to do like an anniversary event for avatar and right before the pandemic and they were like all these people it was like a kind of just a studio event and all these people at nickelodeon all these artists and people in the production staff came through and they like they're like the next generation and the generation after that and they grew up on avatar so it's kind of like when i got to nickelodeon and i grew up on like you know ren and stimpy and stuff and then i am working at nickelodeon and there's like the artwork on the walls i'm like wow this is kind of wild i was watching this stuff when i was a kid and um we were seeing that that generation you know were inspired by avatar and other shows to get into animation and then they were working at the studio and so ramsey in particular really was like i want you guys wow. back and i want you <laughs> in the studio inspiring everybody i i that so. kind of what you guys are setting up this sort of context of how it all happened and how you guys came back it does remind me of uh, uh, how you mentioned a mini Marvel and that now everybody thinks of Marvel as synonymous with this multi-project, you know, big moving, as opposed to like it used to be just comic books and it took years for Hollywood to be like, oh, okay, we can, we can create a bunch of stuff based off of this. And I would love to ask you guys, because it kind of seemed like you were surprised by the support at that sort of like, big company level the nickelodeons the paramounts all that kind of stuff was that different than how it felt when you guys were first starting out in terms of what everybody thought of as avatar and even you yourselves did you think of avatar the last airbender when you were starting out as something that had and i feel i feel this is a weird question because i'm like it, it could i don't mean to imply that you guys had this big ego but that were you thinking like this could be this like multi-tier you know multi-project multimedia franchise or were you like just going episode by episode batch by batch you know season by season how, talk a little bit about how where your guys were with the franchise when it started versus sort of looking at it now yeah i mean certainly back in the day we had no idea this was going to be what we were doing now <laughs> i never thought we'd be doing a, a, a big studio i mean obviously since it was like a big mythological world and had a lot of characters and stuff and was, you know, modeled on, you know, things like Harry Potter and Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and Miyazaki movies. Like we wanted it to have legs and, and, and potentially be able to make more. But yeah, at the, at the time it was like, are we even going to get to finish season one uh, <laughs> or, or, or at least tell this three season arc that we wanted to tell for Aang's story? Yeah, I mean, I would say like, yeah, it's it's all about leadership at these companies. And it's just like with the right leaders, things can be supported or just be sort of like, you know, we, we always had support at, at Nickelodeon, um, but they honestly, we just didn't fit into the Nickelodeon box. So oftentimes they just didn't know right. Right, quite where to put us or what to do with us or what kind of products to make. And, you know, now now that's uh, changed quite a bit so there, there's a lot of a lot of uh movement on all fronts you know with with the content and products and things like that yeah the industry changed you know it's changing still media is changing and not just nickelodeon but any any company any size that's in this in this field is adapting and trying to respond and that has changed the company and um obviously as mike said the leadership has changed and with that you know some 
some new ideas that, that just lined up with the kind of franchise, for lack of a better word, that, that Avatar is, you yeah. know, and, and the kind of stuff that Mike and I want to do. So it's been really exciting because, you know, we're, we're creative people and storytellers and, and world builders. So, you know, way back, we, we always had I mean, in the test pilot, not the thing we aired, but like the original test pilot, you know, the, the lion turtles in it, like we were already thinking really big, <laughs> big picture stuff and stuff that was like way back, like early eras. But we had a, a big task at hand of just like Mike said, just like getting through season <laughs> one. It's like that was that's a ton of work. And and um, but our minds were always working. And sometimes we'd be sitting there. Oh, I had an idea. Like, what if what if this you know, there was like a origin story of this. And so I think, you know, Mike and I were kicking around like the Avatar Wan story, just early ideas, these lion turtle cities and during Avatar, during the original series production. But, you know, we didn't have like, like, oh, well, what's our slate going to be? You know, we, we were like Mike said, we were just trying to get through the original series. We folded that story into Korra because we didn't know if we would ever get another chance to tell it, and it just organically worked into the Korra storyline. But this is a chance where we, you know, one, the first thing we did when Mike and I got together was just us. You know, Avatar Studios was just us, <laughs> which is two of us. And then we, you know, had creative exec join and, and some other people join, and, um, helping us build it out and hire people. And but the, f the first thing we did, even before we had it, you know, Brian Robbins was like, so what do we, what was, <laughs> you got to tell me, what are the ideas? What are we doing? So we just, we just came up, Mike and I like kind of roughed out, like what we would want to do for the next several years. And, uh, and then we developed those things and it's been really exciting to develop it in, in this kind of multi-tiered, oh, cool thing you know and just knowing like how we want it to all plug in and and but then it, the idea is that we're just sort of setting the stage and building these sandboxes and then finding really awesome talented people to come and and play in those sandboxes and 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 as was the case even on the first two series to add their magic to it and their ideas and and expand um so it's it's been really that's the fun part. Executing is 98% of it, yeah. you know. We always get, like, we we don't get it as much now, but, like, people would always, like, usually people who are not in the creative sure. field, Where do you, how do you come up with those sure. ideas? <laughs> Where do you get those ideas? <laughs> and and I think, I don't know, if you're, if you're like, a creative person, you're like, I, I get all that ideas all day. That's not the hard part. It doesn't mean they're all good, yeah. but, like, <laughs> but, like, honestly, Mike and I usually have too many ideas. That's not the that's the fun part, just coming up with ideas, bouncing off each other's ideas. The hard part, the, not, that's 2% of it. 98% of it is is executing it, and that's a nightmare. I, I, <laughs> so. I would just like to also describe to our audio podcast listeners, like Brian was using his hands a lot to talk just now, and he was he was <laughs> setting up this like multi-tier thing, and just with his hands, I knew exactly what he meant, <laughs> and now I have it all spoiled for me, you guys. It was awesome. <laughs> I was remembering some, maybe you all could, <laughs> Mike's, Mike's closer, Mike and I are probably closer in age, but remember that like weird toy that was like a multi-level like flexi thing? What was are you, that? Are you thinking of 3D chess from Star Trek? Is that what you're thinking of? <laughs> yeah, something like that. But there was a product, you know, some Milton Bradley or something. I don't know. So I'm going to have to Google that after this. <laughs> That's what I was picturing was a, a transparent multi-level <laughs> yeah. game. game He's playing. He's playing 4D chess with the Avatar franchise right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so you you talked a little bit about how the industry has changed, and one thing that's changed a lot is there's been a lot more 3D animation. Obviously, Avatar and Korra are gorgeous 2D animation. Is that something you guys are going to venture into? Is, is is are we going to see more 2D, more 3D? Any idea there? There was a big con. I I think there was like early speculation and people snooping around at who we were hiring and there was like there i think there was some like i don't hang out in the message boards and things but there was like they're gonna do 3d ah! and then they heard that we weren't and then they're like they listened to us and that's not true we, <laughs> we're doing what we're doing and it really wasn't influenced we love all sorts of animation and we're going to be doing all sorts of things but 
our main bread and butter is 2D animation, and it's it's an homage to anime and all the stuff that we love. Um, that doesn't mean we're gonna be like like hardcore straight edge like it's 2D. We're using cells and we're painting <laughs> yeah. the backgrounds with with post paint, and we're gonna use multiplane cameras. Like we're not we the way we always look at it is is like start with hand drawn handmade artwork and then what can technology do to help us enhance it to help us deepen it to help the filmmaking make it more cinematic but we're always going to be coming at it from that direction we're not planning on doing anything at the moment especially none of our big projects that are starting purely 3d and then like trying to stylize them we looked at it we thought about it and there's beautiful stuff happening in that space Arcane and Spider Verse are gorgeous and groundbreaking and pushing the envelope, but those are those. That's their own look, and we we're not chasing that stuff. You know, we we didn't like form Avatar Studios to go like chasing someone else's coattails. Yeah. And I think that stuff's beautiful, but a ton of other studios and advertisement agencies are chasing those looks. You know, leave that to them. They've those artists worked hard to form that look. And, and uh, we're working hard to try to form our own look, but it will not be. We're not doing anything purely 3D. In, in terms of the, that was an awesome answer, by the way. It made me so excited. I also <laughs> love all the animation stuff you guys were talking about. But uh, in terms of the storytelling for the future of these stories, Avatar The Last Airbender had that one larger serialized storyline over the course of three seasons. Legend of Korra embraced more slightly standalone single season arcs. Will future projects embrace one style over the other? Uh, will the style of storytelling further evolve? Can you guys talk a little bit about that at all? I mean, I think I would just say it It, it just depends on the project and the, the medium. I mean, like, we're making our first, you know, feature film, and, like, that's a different storytelling beast where yeah. we're, we're learning, yeah. you know, the hard way is, is, like Brian said, we have so many ideas, like, too many to pack into you know a feature <laughs> film um so we're we're you know culling stuff and, and just figuring out the best way to tell a, a satisfying you know feature length story um but then yeah for series you know um i think i think the difference now you know the reason we kind of went with the model we did with cora was we didn't know how many seasons we were going to have i mean we were i think we were a little probably naive with with the avatar because like that could have ended after 13 episodes and <laughs> you don't get that full storyline but we kind of shot shot for the moon there and luckily it paid off uh but cora you know we we were only picked up for the one season at first so you know we tried to design it so that like if that's all we get to make it's a, a beginning middle and end with a satisfying story um you know the, the benefit of having this support in this studio and and multi-year plans is that we can plan more for like oh if this if this uh series is going to be you know three seasons or four seasons or five seasons we could plan the story you know more cohesively from the beginning so yeah we like i I remember that that structure for cora actually was i think the impetus was a request from nickelodeon they were like they were like you know it was kind of a smaller season which was actually to be clear, that was the original size of a season that we preferred. Yeah. We liked 12 to 14 over 20. So we were excited about that. And then they asked that, and we just where we were at that time, we were like, you know what, that's cool. We, we kind of like the idea of like each season could have its own villain and its own kind of like arc. But then there is a sort of over the, the a sort of arc for Korra herself, you know, um, which all we knew was like starting with someone who was a very physical kind of bruiser, like a fighter becoming a very spiritual person. And, and that was, that was always going to be her arc. And so I think with Mike and I, we tend to not want to do the same exact thing over again. And, and so I think we looked, we, you know, making avatar was many years. It was very exhausting. And, um, very Sisyphusian, if that's a word. And like, <laughs> I think when we came back to do Korra, I, I personally had only just kind of recharged, the, you know, refueled the battery cells. And I was like, I think the idea of just doing that same kind of shape thing was just not 
very creatively interesting. So we wanted a different type of avatar. We wanted a different tone. We wanted, you know, that will put off some fans. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to do what feels most creatively fresh for us. And I always say the, the test audience for Avatar is Mike and Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then obviously, like, our trusted collaborators. But, like, if we don't like it, we're just like, oh, we don't really want to do it. So we need to be excited about it. It needs to feel fresh to us. So, like Mike said, we, we have a bunch of projects planned, and there's a kind of spectrum of tones. And so, what we're with all of them, we're not like, let's just do that Aang model because that was what worked. We're like, what's the best format for this? What's the best creative format for this type of story? What's the best art direction for that type of story? Cool. You know, like we, we, but we all we always want it to feel like avatar and that's just a weird nebulous <laughs> litmus test that's like we're just like ah. we just look at each other ah, doesn't feel. And usually like 99.999 percent mike and i go and then feel like avatar if we don't you know we usually agree so uh i'm also a really big fan of fce's kyoshi novels what was it like to oversee all of these other Avatar stories in the interim between the show and Avatar Studios? And did doing that, uh, did, was that process helpful in your new roles at Avatar Studios? Yeah, so I consulted on that. That was kind of in between, in this nebulous in-between phase after Korra. Um, but it was also kind of, it was similar to the, the way we worked with, you know, Gene Yang on the uh, graphic novels and then Faith Aaron Hicks. Um, so we've had, you know, we've had experience like setting up some ideas for for a writer to, to then take further and, and embellish and stuff. And yeah, working with FC was great. Um, he really took to the the that character and and again, like we didn't have like it's not like we had an exhaustive history of, of Kiyoshi worked out. We had some ideas of like kind of who she became, but you know, he really came to the table with a lot of great ideas of like how she could have gotten there and added a lot of new characters and new locations and spirits and stuff to the mythology um, that is then being drawn upon for like, we're doing this uh, magpie RPG, tabletop RPG game. Like they're drawing on the lore from the shows, but also like the, the graphic novels and the novels. So, you know, it's all kind of feeding into the, the overall mythology and that, and that was, you know, part of the big reason why coming back was a good thing to do because it's like trying to wrangle all that. It was sort of all the, you know, these things were happening sort of separately and, and there wasn't any one person sort of like making sure it was all fitting together um, other than us coming in here and there to, to sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, and, and some projects sort of went off the rails a little bit and, and whatever. <laughs> but now we can have a much more cohesive strategy of like, Here's the story types of stories we're going to tackle in the novels. Here's the storylines we're going to do in the comics. Here's, cool. and then and then if we know like if there's stuff we're gonna we're planning for in, in the the series or the movies, like oh we can't we're not going to do that in the novels right now because we have plans for something like that in you know a series. So, yeah, and we have we have now we have other people helping us do this yeah. just <laughs> this like 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 a story editor helping us just keep track of yeah. all of this narrative content. Because that could be in a tabletop RPG, that could be in a in a prose novel, that could be in a graphic novel, could be in a, a video game, and it's it's it, so now we have more than one person helping us keep track of all this, and I don't know all of this. Stuff, <laughs> you know? so, yeah, so. yeah. To to go off of what you guys are describing, right at Lucasfilm, the fans know that there is a like story group, and that is their job is to kind of. To, to be aware of all that, that huge expansive lore that has been around since the 70s. And now with Avatar and Korra, in addition to novels and graphic novels, there are so many new Avatar stories outside of those original series. Uh, what is this sort of future like? And again, if you can't exactly answer, we totally get it. But it's like, are, are we looking at those stories and, and using them for any future storylines? Or is this kind of going to maybe turn into a Star Wars Legends situation, which is totally still cool, you know, like different realities take on on Avatar and Korra? How, how have you guys sort of approached that? And is it even a problem? Like, it, it, it could, could something in the Avatar world get so big, the lore get so big, that you're like, well, now this might need to be 
labeled a different kind of a thing, but it's still Avatar, or is the plan to, to keep everything all in that same story? I mean, I mean, Avatar's pretty old, but it's not. We haven't been going since the yeah, 70s, right. so I don't. Think, yeah. I don't think we've grown like appendages that large yet. <laughs> yeah, we I was gonna just say, it, be like, yeah, at least like we, you know, we've been involved in all those main kind of ancillary stories. So, right. You know, um, so in our minds, you know, it's it's mostly canon. There's probably some <laughs> stuff if like we may go back and be like, ah, that didn't doesn't totally line up with this. So there may be some little tweaks here and there, but. Um, you know, as of right now, we're kind of proceeding as if all this stuff is, is part of the proper universe and, and uh, you know, hopefully building on it. I think the thing we're not doing right now, not to say this couldn't happen someday, is like we're not adapting the graphic novels into a TV show and we're not adapting the YA novels into a movie or a TV show. Um, again, that could happen in the future, <laughs> but... Um, but we are, but we are like, feeding off. Yeah, yeah, totally. Cool. You know, they're, like, they're... And, and just to be clear, like, Mike has always been way more involved in the publishing side of sure, stuff than sure. I have. Um, like, A, he's way faster reader than I am. <laughs> That's one of the big things. And I'm a slow artist, and I'm usually working on, like, the visual side of stuff. Um, not that I'm not, you know, I'm very involved in our main stories and stuff, but, uh, so... Mike just has a, a stronger kind of inclination towards that stuff. So he has, has more often supervised. I'm usually with the publishing stuff. I'm usually more involved initially. I'll meet with, you know, Gene or, or, or Faith and with, along with Mike and our editors and, and kind of, Oh, that sounds like that feels like avatar. And then I sort of go away and then I'll, I might give notes. <laughs> like I, I, I had more on the, like after Gene and Guru here, I had more to, more involvement on the art and and the kind of scripts than i had previously um but like the novels i, I didn't really i i was there initially again but not not as much um throughout the process so a lot of it is i'm kind of like well what happened in there and then we look at it and oh oh well we could you know like that lines up with what we're doing or something um but yeah again we we just haven't there's a lot going on but we're it, i mean you look at star wars and it's, there's just so many <laughs> streams and and comics you know like with marvel or something i'm not a big comics person but i know it's like they kind of have to retire a storyline and well we're in a new you know like and like just history moves on yeah. and then okay we kind of have to reinvent this character for this era and, and like we're not there yet where it's sort of like that's your that's your 4d chess yeah we're, we're not quite there yet. um so no need for multiverses we'll leave that for spider verse yeah. <laughs> We uh, we also got to talk to Jeremy Zuckerman today, and we've been we've been singing this from the r rooftops wherever we can. Do you have any idea official releases for Avatar and Korra music? Is it in the cards? Yes, I'll just say yes. It's it's definitely we're we're working on we've it. We've been working um, on it for twenty years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, this might it might actually happen this time. That, so, that that's yeah. what Jeremy said. Uh, but I feel I feel like maybe we've jinxed it. By saying <laughs> yeah. that no, no, no. Because no, like, we will we will because... delete this out of the podcast, sir. If that's if, that, if, if we jinxed there's it, so, no. There, we have been there are so many times we have been so close. Yeah. And it seemed so real, and then and then like a year goes by, and we're like, "What happened with that?" And then we're like, "No, that." Everyone's like, "That was never real." And we're like, "What?" <laughs> being like gaslit. But, so, but, but yeah, um, Jeremy did say that it that it to, it's very it's feeling right very to him. Real, it feels right. closer than it's ever felt, and especially with yeah. how you guys are working on new stuff and new stories. And there's you know, like you said on the Braving the Elements podcast, there's about to be a bunch of Avatar stuff in a few years' time. There's going to be a lot more. That uh, yeah, it seems like this is the perfect time to. Um, when yeah. we started, you know, Brian Robbins was like, "Look, if there's anything you guys want to do," and we were like, "Sound." <laughs> yes. And I've had multiple <laughs> like phone conversations. It's been a while now, but with Brian Robbins, like, can you please like, can we just make this happen? <laughs> and what's cool is like, he's just like, "Yeah, that should happen." And that wasn't always, we weren't always hearing that. Right, you know? right. But getting it to happen is another story because it involves record companies and, and licenses and, and just, well, you know, moving that, you, moving that rock. You, you, you know, know this, the fans are with you helping you move that rock, man. I'm serious. If you guys were even like, let's just kickstart it. It would be the fastest funded Kickstarter <laughs> in it. Like, we, like, yeah, we, I don't even think yeah. it's, I don't even think it's money's not right. even, it's, it's just, just getting everyone to just, 
I don't know what it is yeah. because we're 20 years <laughs> in and I'm like lost. I can't see the forest for the trees anymore. It's like, uh, but no, it's, um, there's definitely momentum. Everyone knows ad nauseum how, ex- <laughs> how that's important to, all, to us. Um, it's, it's important to us. Obviously the fans want it, but also just like to honor the incredible work that Jeremy has done yeah. and, and to be able to, enjoy it on its own i mean i'm we got to do the one book one release of cora and that comes up on my shuffle <laughs> and i'm always just i'm just like driving and all of a sudden i'm like in a movie you know <laughs> and i'm like what is, oh yeah of course it's jeremy you know and I've, i have a bunch of his other soundtracks that that you know for other movies and shows that he's done and and they all whenever they come up i'm always like oh, i'm in some epic <laughs> epic scene so can't wait for it to happen, but yeah, please just hang on a little bit longer. We're we're really trying. Well, uh, like we said, we talked to Janet and Dante yesterday, and Dante told us this story, and I know that he related to you guys on the Braving the Elements podcast as well, but he was mentioning how this young fan came up to him and was like, you don't understand. These shows have programmed our generation to be ready for what's happening in the world right now. You know, Dante was telling us that this young fan was like, why do you think Black Lives Matter was happening in our, like, this generation, like, this sort of activism? To be clear, we're not going to take credit for Black <laughs> no, no, no. Matter. I mean, Good as, call, Brian. Like, Get out in front of that. I'm Good not call. trying Good to call. take credit. And, uh, these were, these you know, were Dante. Dante's words to us, but, but this sort of sentiment. <laughs> I'm a huge supporter of Absolutely. Black Lives Matter. I want to also be clear Absolutely. about that. But I don't want anyone to think it's, that we are like, oh, yeah, that, that. Um, I, uh, that's obviously really sweet and amazing to hear and 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 overwhelming and humbling um but that just shows the power of storytelling and why stories uh, why humans tell them and and retell them and rework them and work off of these models just because you know i know mike's done way more like actual intellectual investigation into how stories function in in societies and i i've certainly thought about it a lot for my graphic novels and like like um and it, it is important it's not just entertainment and you can say that and there is stuff that just seems f- like fluff but if you really think about it you're reflecting something back you're reflecting you're reflecting a value system back to even like the trashiest reality <laughs> tv is reflecting values and what's important to a society and 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 how we're rate you know this constant how we're rating things and stacking up who can be on those shows and who's worth looking mm. at and listening to and and desiring or mocking or whatever it's it's all it's all a reflection of a society's values or or a, or a portion of a put or perspective on society and and so um it's it's honored honoring to hear that there's you know a generation that feels avatar did prepare them in some way or help them you know cuz hopefully that's what stories can do is 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 like a, a guide for the challenges in life so yeah mike i would love to ask have you also seen any of that kind of i mean if you're online especially the past few years i've seen people use avatar memes to, to sort of reflect what's happening in the world. Have you seen any of that either online or even just any kind of fan interaction or fan response that echoes that sort of sentiment? I mean, I've seen probably what everyone else has seen, you know, the, the, <laughs> all the articles that came out, you know, after uh, the show kind of resurged on Netflix and stuff and just, yeah, people kind of commenting of how relevant it is now and and stuff like that and and again i think we've talked about this in other places but you know i i think that's partly because we are dealing in in myth and these kind of you know stories that transcend just like today and and the fads of of the present day or whatever um and you know and we were drawing on you know we were inspired by sometimes historical events of the past and history tends to repeat itself so you know eventually (laughs) all the things that happened in avatar will come to pass unfortunately (laughs) um you know uh but yeah i mean the one that really stuck out to me was the 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 whole bossing say 
you know, there is no war in Bossing Say. Just, just the the lies and disinformation, which <laughs> have unfortunately become all too um, prevalent. These it, it, it'll yeah. happen again, gentlemen. But it seems like this generation that grew up on these shows will be ready. That's that. That's going to be the. Uh, 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 a, I a hope key so. Thing, yeah. <laughs> we need somebody <laughs> ready. <laughs> It's a scary, scary time. It's only getting scarier every day, and and Avatar is not going to solve it. Um, but just having, uh, you know, a young generation that values empathy and and justice, and and the big we we always tried to make Avatar about balance and not about good versus evil. We always tried to make it just trying to find harmony. And uh, between disparate elements, mm -hmm. be those societal or actual elements, and and so, um, and and again, it, Avatar is not just Mike and me. You know, we created it and created the main characters and the main the main arc and and world. But you know, a lot of writers and and um, artists and animators really contributed to it. And as we've been discussing, have expanded this world and. Um, so, you know, it was just people who had a sort of common kind of outlook on <laughs> how to deal with conflict, you know, that it isn't, it isn't so black and white. It, there, there's always nuance to it. It's always complicated and, and there is no f thing that is purely good or usually even something that's really horrible can have a kind of positive after effect. And so... Uh, we just tried to take that um, general perspective on things and not necessarily judging things, but just trying to examine them. And I think one of the the trends in all this scary stuff happening in the world is just a swing towards just a very black and white binary view of things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of pendulum. And maybe that's the, you know, that's the eternal struggle for balance is that people who look at things more nuanced and then people who want it to be right wrong good evil pure impure and by trying to run the world that way creating more suffering <laughs> than needs to exist so yeah. um yeah hopefully uh, hopefully what we've made already has helped and hopefully the stuff we're making will kind of just help open people's minds and hearts but yeah it's scary stuff well, that's an exciting. <laughs> hey, well, podcast. maybe one more question that ends on an upbeat. Let's. Uh, <laughs> so maybe maybe you can't answer this in full since you guys are at Avatar Studios. But are there any other mediums you're excited to explore Avatar in, like video games, VR, theme parks? I mean, SpongeBob got a musical. Don't see why Avatar can't get one. <laughs> well, here I'll I'll do my uh, you know yearly pitch of. Uh, I think a, a Cirque du Soleil style production would be very cool for Avatar. Yes. Uh, I've been pitching this for many years. Oh, man. Um, yes. I don't think a musical is going to cut it. Uh, Brian's <laughs> not a fan of musicals. <laughs> Neither uh, is Jeremy. Jeremy yeah, was like, not a fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I don't think it could translate, but I could see a, a very cool stage production with, yeah. with music and, you know, a storyline and stuff. That could be very cool. Wow. Sounds amazing. I, I mean, I love like Hedwig and the Angry Inch. You know, like, <laughs> sure, I like, sure. Like a, like a, like a cool. No, rock, Jeremy was opposed know. to all of it. Let's just throw him under the bus. He was like, <laughs> I don't like us. A... Oh, I'm with. I'll, I'll stand. <laughs> okay, with okay. You can throw me with yeah, yeah. But yeah, we love that stage. Yeah, we're. I mean, we are. Uh, there are a bunch of video games in the works. Uh, the tabletop RPG. You know, Magpie's been. They're an incredible partner, and we've been really inspired by the. The stuff the materials they've been generating and that's that's exciting and um i mean you know animation is always going to be our main um our main thing but even within there like mike and i are really excited about these different the, i mean the the smaller things we're doing i we're just as excited about the like oh the really big stuff um sometimes the smaller stuff there's more freedom there um there's less pressure it can be something really we're still artists, you <laughs> yeah. Know? We just want to make cool stuff, and uh, and I think we're we're excited that we don't have to. We have those opportunities to tell stories in different ways. That's that's exciting. 
it's it, it's an incredibly exciting time to be an Avatar and Korra fan. And we sort of relay this to Jeremy, this idea that like you guys right now are in the trenches, you're working hard. I'm sure you're online and I'm sure you're seeing excitement, but like John and I get to, as fans, tell you guys directly, we are right there with you. We are so stoked about what's coming down the line and we just we're so excited that you guys are excited and you know get to tell your stories and and get to revisit this world and everything so just from the fans john and i and everybody we got you back we're here this is so cool we're it's a we're about to you know we're like at a waterfall we're about to see a bunch of stuff so we're just right there with you guys and and we want to thank you so much for talking to us and and sharing some great insight and confirming the soundtrack releases (laughs) uh well, again, don't no, like, don't no, no, take no. that too no. far. <laughs> we don't we don't have a date it. or anything. No, so. no, no. <laughs> Confirming that you guys are considering it and that the powers that be, it's all in the works and it could maybe yeah. happen. That's the confirmation. So, yeah. Again, John, anything else you'd like to say to Brian and Mike before we let them go? No. Thank you so much for talking to us. This was so great. Well, thank you. Awesome. That's our show, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. And thanks again to John Piricello for helping me break down all that awesome Avatar news and talk to Janet and Dante. John, where can our listeners find you online and support your work? Thank you, man. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, you guys can find me at Johnny Two Cellos on YouTube. You can also find me there on most other social platforms. Uh, also, the Cartoons That Curse podcast is on all podcast platforms, as well as we have a YouTube video version as well. I hope to see you guys there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for listening. Stay tuned next week for another episode of Comic-Con Metapod. Until then, stay cool. Bye.